Guys, my name is Kellis, one of the pastors here at Berean Community Fellowship. I do not spray when I talk. Why, why, you guys are like trying to stand back from me. You guys ever been to like SeaWorld, Shamu, and this is like the splash zone or something. Everybody, nobody wants to get wet this morning. Uh, well, that's great. You know, people are coming late. We'll just like highlight them here. They make them sit up front. Um, but I love you guys. It's good to see you. Uh, what you can expect this morning, I'm going to do some announcements uh, here pretty soon. I'm probably going to need your help to get through them all. I know of a couple, but I think there's more. Uh, we're going to sing some songs. Uh, one of the things that we always say, I really encourage you guys, whether you know the song or not, to really just meditate, think on the lyrics. So you're not just uh, saying things, but really think about it and mean it. Make it a prayer. Uh, we're going to get into God's Word. We're continuing a Bible study, a lesson, kind of, a, I guess, a series is a more accurate word of what really matters. There uh, is a couple pieces of paper, you guys may or may not have seen them, posted on these three uh, columns, and then uh, over here by our uh, dry erase board, it has a question. Actually, Paul, would you mind reading the question out really loud? What church has it right? What church has it right? And then why? And then beneath that, I asked the question in a different way. The ideal church in your mind does what well? There's something I wanted you guys to be thinking about, maybe even discussing this morning. It's kind of what is leading us into this series of what really matters. We're studying Revelation, the letters to the church, and looking at it. What are the things that God, uh, or Jesus, as he wrote through John to the churches, commended them for? And what are the things that he rebuked them for that they needed to change? And we want to make sure that we have those things right. So that's what you guys can expect this morning. So announcements. Here we go. This is my worst thing. All right. I'm trying not to like ask you guys what's on the board. But what's on the board? What's the top? <laughs> Experiencing God. All right. So this is this is an announcement. We've been doing this. Uh, a co-ed study on Wednesday nights, getting together. Um, we're going to be doing this for a little while longer, I think another 11 weeks or so. Uh, and then we're going to be breaking off, having a, a, a break from co-ed studies and doing more of our uh, gender-specific, so a ladies' time, uh, a men's time, uh, maybe even our kids' groups. We'll get those back together. Um, but this is a wonderful Bible study, and I'm so excited for everyone who's a part of this I just have to say now, though, we, we are too far into it. So if you were still kind of on the fence, maybe I want to do it. Maybe if I can, I'm sorry it's too late. We will be doing the Experiencing God, Lord willing, again later this year. Um, but we will be doing it again. And I know already there's some people who are looking forward to the next time through. Uh, but for those guys who are not in it this week, I'm asking for prayer. There's homework which is like, I got a lot of rebuke over that. <laughs> no, um, Homework's intimidating. Uh, and people are like, I don't really want to have to do homework. But there's homework. Uh, it's a commitment. So I'm asking everybody to pray for the people who are part of this Bible study. I told you guys, it's probably top three most influential Bible studies of my life. It just looks at, at God and what he's doing and his involvement in our life from a different angle that a lot of people... A lot of churches don't highlight. Um, it's always about what we do for God and, you know, and what His will is for our life. This is a study about finding what is He doing and then changing our life to join Him rather than inviting Him into what we want to do. So pray for us. If, uh, that's ongoing. Next up. Communion, all right. We, uh, we're trying to be a little bit more faithful in this. We love communion. We love how powerful it is. Um, but to be honest, like, I have a second job, and somebody has her phone on, uh, so we'll just laugh. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so communion, yeah, I just want to give you guys a heads up on this. Uh, when is it? It's not this coming week, but it's the, f it is next week. It's next week. All right, so you guys can heads up on that, communion. Um, I, I, men's breakfast, yeah, I, I didn't ask. <laughs> I remembered that one. So uh, that's on the 19th. We're trying to do this monthly men's breakfast here, 8 o'clock. Not sure what the menu is, but they've been great. We usually stay, what, around like an hour and a half, 10 o'clock. Uh, we eat and then um, just have a time of prayer and see what you guys want to talk about. Um, so I encourage you guys to come to that. 
Are there any others? Oh, yeah. Can I get an amen? Can I get a ride on, guys? Let's have a potluck. <laughs> Some of you guys have the spiritual gift of potlucking. Uh, <laughs> and that's usually high attendance Sunday, right? People come out of nowhere. I'm like, I thought you moved. <laughs> you know, but they show up for potluck. Uh, we like to do that. We typically plan it for like whenever there's a month that has five Sundays. I think we're going to continue with that. But I think January had five Sundays and we missed one. So just in the name of the Lord, we got we to gotta bring it back. <laughs> uh, so that's, I'll give you guys plenty of notice. That's going to be the 20, is it the 27th? I think it's the last Sunday of this month. So uh, just encourage you guys to be there. Um, all right. Now for you guys, is there any announcements? Anything going on in your life you want to share with us? Anything... Anything need a prayer? This is, I mean, we're still a small enough church. We can do this and, and, and stand up and this is your opportunity. And I know I put you guys on the spot, but I do this every Sunday. So really, you should know. Yeah, please. Yeah, praise the Lord. Grandma J. Yeah. <laughs> right on, we're praising. We're glad to see you. For sure, you guys are always welcome. And pretty soon, when your husband can join you guys, we want you to come up and tell us about your ministry and how we can support and be, pray for you guys. Um, any other announcements? What's going on, guys? Anything you guys just can't, get, can't wait to share? What's God doing? I know I put you on the spot, but I'm giving you an opportunity. Can't say I'm not. All right, so I want to do something now. We're going to transition in just a time of prayer. Um, one of the things that we see when we look at the New Testament, the churches, they, they pray. They like to pray. I hope you guys like to pray. It's a wonderful gift. So one of the things that we'd like to do is pray for anybody who needs healing, who's going through something. I know of a few people. You may or may not come forward. That's fine. We'll pray for you anyways. But just to, uh, uh, if anybody would be willing and bold enough to just say, yeah, I need prayer, please raise your hand. Let us know. We'll pray for you. But specifically, I want to bring up who, uh, Bridget. You guys know Ned and Bridget, dear friends of ours. Uh, they're sick, and they've had just a rough time keeping help down at the Salvation Army camp. You guys know that, that they manage it down there. Well, now they're sick. They've got no help. Like, they're struggling, and they've got an event coming up pretty soon. So uh, I want to pray for them that just that the Lord would give them the strength to do what's needed, uh, that the Lord would bring good help, reliable help down to the camp. So we're going to pray for them as well. Uh, we know a few people that have what we call, what the doctors call long COVID, like they're, they're, they're past COVID, but they're still having symptoms and tough coughs and fevers at night. And um, we want to pray for, for those guys too. We want to pray for them. Is there anything else, guys, anything else that somebody needs prayer for? We're going to um, start here pretty soon. And if you feel led, you can just jump out and pray. But Okay, okay. Is, is he still up there right now? On the road. Okay, so we'll pray for his safe travels. But that's a praise right on, right on. All right, so how about this? If it's really important to you guys, we'll know that you'll pray for it. Um, we'll give you guys opportunity. Um, We'll turn all the, the volumes down, too, so it's not public, even though we're live. We love you guys who are live. We're going to pray now. Um, and then if you feel led, uh, just jump out. Musicians, come on up, and then after a minute, you guys just lead us in some songs. Father, we are here for you. Lord, nothing else matters but your opinion, your word, your instruction, your correction. Lord, we are drawing near to you. Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we believe that you have brought us here for a reason and for a purpose. And so I ask, God, that you would give us all ears to hear and a heart to receive, whatever that is. Lord, that we would just come before you expectantly and eager, um, desiring to hear from you. Lord, we thank you. You are what we need. You're the cause to our life. You're the effect of our life. You, Lord, you are the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, and we gather in your name to glorify you, but also, Lord, 
for our benefit because you have what we need. And there are people here, Lord, who are sick and you know what they're going through. Whether they're sick or they're just stressed and they have concerns and genuine worries, Lord, I ask God that you would just remind them that you are sovereign, that you are in control. Lord, I ask God that you would be our comforter, that you would be our protector, Lord, that we would turn to you in struggles, we would turn to you right now in our affliction and, and ask for your help, Lord, and we ask for healing. We ask for deliverance. We ask for supernatural miracles that just cause us to praise your name out on the, the street corners and in the workplace. Lord, we want to praise your name. Lord, we also want people to see the Lord, that no matter what happens, you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of it all. So, Lord, we pray for these people. We pray for Bridget. We pray for others who are sick. And we ask, God, that you would heal them, you would comfort them, and you would draw them into your presence. Lord, we love you. And we give this time for you, for your glory and our benefit. Amen. Are we still praying? Oh, yeah. That was kind of unclear. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You can lead us. Does anybody still need to pray? If you feel it, then pray, and we'll sing. <laughs>
a clean and a pure heart. With pure motives. Pray that you would humble me. Pour out your spirit on this gathering. That we would come before you confidently, boldly, but humbly. true worship.
It's all about you. It's all about you. You're looking into my heart again. It's all about you. It's all about you. Years ago when I was a teenager, more than anything, was the day I would finally get a marriage license. I remember when I first met Callie, I saw her and the first thing that crossed my mind was, wow, finally, somebody with whom I could share a marriage license. I remember I got down on one knee you know, I mean, I saw her, I was like, this is marriage license potential right here. But I got down on one knee and I asked her, Callie, would you be willing to share with me forevermore a marriage license? And, and you know, it, she said yes. <laughs> I remember even on our wedding day, I got out of bed. I was so excited. Today I finally get my marriage license. We went through this ceremony and I'm like, gosh, hurry up, dad. My dad married us. I can't wait to get out of here and rush to his office so we can sign this marriage license. And we did. We didn't go down the aisle. We just went right to the back office and we're where, there waiting for him to come. And we, we signed it. We went through the, our, our reception and we're getting ready to leave on our wedding night. We're going to some motel. Who knows? I remember how much it cost. Gosh. But we... Uh, we got there, and I said, honey, I can't wait any longer. Let's go to Walmart and get a frame. I, w- I want to frame this marriage license. And we did. We bought a frame, a gorgeous frame. We took it back to our hotel room, and we stayed up all night just admiring this beautiful marriage license. Now, after 15, almost 16 wonderful years, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, what I appreciate most For 15 years, I've had a marriage license, and I'm thankful that you made that happen. (laughs) Are you guys buying any of this? (laughs) 
Come on, not even a little. No one gets married in order to just have a marriage license. I proposed to Callie because I found someone, the one, that I wanted to share a passionate love affair for the rest of my life. Couldn't let her leave my life. And I do possess. I, we have a marriage license. I couldn't tell you where it is. But I can tell you where my wife is. Right there. Not you, Paul. Right behind you. <laughs> I married for the relationship. Now, we get that. That makes sense. You guys are tracking with me. We get it. In the same way, we would never mistake that our ultimate purpose of salvation is to obtain a ticket to heaven. That's not what it's about. It's about joining into a love relationship with the God, the creator of God, who is wildly and passionately in love with us. That's what it's all about, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. If you guys have your Bible, everybody hold your Bible in the air. Wave it around like you just don't care. And everybody say word. word. All right, and we're going to have it on the screen too, but I want you guys to have your Bible. I want you to be familiar with it. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Now, the title of our series, I said this earlier, is What Really Matters. We're using the seven churches of Revelation to kind of sort through that discussion. And last week in chapter 1, John really just laid the foundation of our study. He reminded us that the book of Revelation is not the unveiling of events. Sometimes we get so caught up with the charts and the, the timelines, it says clearly it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. And just this, this magnificent job that he went into uh, chapter 1 to unveil Jesus as a prophet. He unveiled him as a priest, as a king. And he reminded us that it's this Jesus, this, this glorified, awe-inspiring depiction of Jesus who loves us, who shed his blood to save us, who is the one who's reconciled us to a relationship with the Holy God. We also saw that when we're talking about Church, according to God's de definition, the non-negotiable about a church is that you must believe and affirm that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. That, that he, we call that, you know, uh, the, the incarnation, his divinity, but also that, that as God in the flesh, he shed his blood to atone for our sin, to take the payment of our sin upon himself so that we, by faith, may receive forgiveness, but much more than forgiveness, actually be restored to a good and healthy relationship with our Creator God. And to, and to be a part of the Christian church, we must affirm so the deity of Christ, affirm that it's Jesus, He is the, the one and only way of salvation. And there's no, guys, there's no wiggle room there. And I don't feel like you guys are the ones to, to fight and push back on this. But that's what really sets us apart. I don't care what other churches say they do or don't do and who they are and who they're not. If they don't affirm this, they're not, they're not like us. They're not Christian. John went on to unveil Jesus as the glorified Christ. And again, this, this magnificent picture, an amazing picture that just transcends this carpenter that many of us just love, but he's so much more than that. Um, and, and so he reminds us that he in this glorified state, has the opinion, the only opinion of our lives that matters. And so with that, he prays for us that, that we would have ears to hear and a heart to receive his word. That means essentially that we come to him wanting to hear what he has to say because what he has to say matters to us. That's essentially what it's saying. When we get into God's word, do you even have a concern? What is Jesus trying to tell me? If not... Pray, Lord, give me ears to hear. Give me a heart to receive his word. So again, that's where we're at. We're going to pick it up in chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. So again, chapter 1 tells us that, that the lampstands represent the churches, and these stars represent angels. And I've heard lots of people uh, talk about what that is. I, th I think it's easiest to, to really, I guess, 
agree. We don't know exactly, but I think it's easiest to understand that they're just some kind of delegate. Maybe it's the pastor who was sent from these churches to pick up these letters. And, and later they were, they were put together to get the one book of Revelation, this letter that we're reading now, but these were individual letters that were given to these people to take it back. That's the easiest, less controversial. I mean, it's just like you don't have to make a stretch. That makes sense and, it, and it, it's easy to accept. So it's, it's, it's a, some of these, one of the reasons why we haven't gotten into Revelation before, not that it's not important, but because when you get into that and there's so many ideas and thoughts of what these things mean, you find I end up preaching three sermons. You know, this is what one group, and this is why they think about it. And this is how another group, and this is why they think about it. And, and it's just so many things. When you look at this, this particular reference, some people say that this represents the different churches of the ages. And that it's, it's metaphorical even. I just think that's a really weak argument. I don't, even, I don't even think you could really make that point. I think if you look at it, maybe in the descriptions, there's an argument for maybe two that seem to fit with that, but the rest are, are going to be a stretch. Two out of seven is not a majority. I think that's a really hard argument to say that these are metaphorical churches of the ages. I think they're just, it's easiest to understand that more logically, these are just simply seven churches that are in Asia. And again, that number seven is important. Seven represents completeness and wholeness. I think as we look at these seven specific churches that were there, some now still, but there historically, we can see a little bit of everything the church has and comes across. So it's the church as a whole, but represented by seven specific local churches. If you guys look on a map and you start with Ephesus, uh, it, it makes really a loop. It goes all the other churches. It makes a loop into modern day, uh, well, it, it would have been like South, uh, South Asia or Asia Minor, but, but it's, it's modern day Turkey. And, and you can see a loop. Starting with the churches of Ephesus, though, it's actually, uh, we see it's interesting for several reasons. One of the things, and I just love the book of Ephesus. We've taught through it at least twice in our time here in Kentucky. We've taught through Ephesus. It's a wonderful book. I love the, the content that we get out of there in the New Testament. But, but history actually tells us that John, this John, was actually a pastor of Ephesus. Did you guys know that? This uh, this John before I think I think history tells us that that he was the actual the pastor of Ephesus up until he got in trouble and was sentenced to the island of Patmos where he is now. That's really cool. But we also see that that Paul was a pastor at Ephesus. He was the pastor for probably I think it was three years. We also see that Timothy spent some time as, as the pastor in Ephesus. This church has an all-star lineup of, of pastors. A wonderful place. If we look at Ephesus as a city, it was a happening city, a big city, very, uh, without question, really one of the most significant cities in that area in that time. It was a, a political center of the city. I mean, the, one of the emperors, or the emperor had a temple, uh, the emperor had a temple there. The Roman governor had a palace there. It was a place of commerce. It was right on like, like just a hub of, of three main highways that went through there. So it had lots of, of just significant people coming and going. Um, so not only like I said, it was a political hub, but it was a religious hub. It was a religious capital. It had the magnificent temple of, you guys remember who? The Greek god Artemis. We know, I guess, maybe the Roman name a little bit better the temple of Diana. It was uh, the god of fertility. And, and that, that temple with the statue of Artemis it was known as one of the seven wonders of the old world, ancient, ancient world. It was also a very wicked city with all the people coming in, all the commerce there. Of course, the goddess of fertility, they had thousands of priestesses who were all just prostitutes. Very wicked city, very difficult place to have a church, but we would look at it also as a very necessary, needed place to have a church. So that's a little bit about that. Verse 2, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. 
and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance and endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. That's a wonderful commendation. I would love for years down the road, people would look to the Berean Fellowship and say, man, they were on it. Again, I was able to share this yesterday, though why we call ourselves Berean. We're not from the city of Berea. <laughs> uh, but Berea was a wonderful place that we read about in Acts chapter 16. After Paul fled Thessalonica, they were trying to kill him. He went to Berea. And there started preaching, and the people there said that they received what he had to say. They, they, they checked at the Scripture to see if what he said was true, and he, they called them more noble-minded. There's other words that you guys see, but they were commended for going to the Scriptures and testing things. They had Paul. I mean, this was Paul bringing them a word, and they're still going to Scripture and be like, well, let me make sure it's right. They didn't really care who it was. The Scripture was the authority in, the, in their church. Uh, in, in the church of Berea. So we want to have a similar testimony. It says that they, uh, they dealt with false apostles. One of the problems of the church that's really always had to deal with was false teachers. People coming in and saying that this, I've got a word from God. In fact, you actually guys uh, talked about, you know, just the history in Ephesus. You guys can go to Acts chapter 19 and 20 and read about this church. And again, Paul was there and as he's ready to leave in Acts 20, he clearly said to the elders, to, to uh, the elders at Ephesus, that he feared that there would be savage wolves who came in and tried to lead them astray and actually tried to destroy the sheep. I think it's very likely that the people that Paul identified are the people talked about here, him saying, like, you, you were on guard. You tested these guys, and you found them out and pushed them out. You found them out to be false apostles. So I think it, they, they listened to Paul. They heard what Paul had to say, and they were diligent. So this is very high praise. They were doing so much. But then we get to verse 4. I know, I feel the same way. We get to verse 4. But I have this against you, that you've left your first love. The Greek word for left is a word that means you've abandoned your first love. Jesus speaks to the church of Ephesus and he says, you know, you guys have been working really hard. I see it. You've kept the bad guys out. You've been standing for truth. You're doing so much. You're hanging in there. Things are getting tough. You're persevering. But the problem is this. You just don't love me like you used to. I don't see the fire anymore. When I look into your eyes, I just don't see it there. Now tr try to imagine this scene. Imagine that I'm trying to be a great husband. It's not very hard, but I try. <laughs> I'm really humble too. No, but... I'm disciplined, and, and I get up every day, and I go to work, and I bring home a paycheck, and I keep up on Callie's honey-do list, which is ever-evolving. And I'm actually ahead of it. I'm anticipating things. I take, I'm taking out the garbage. I'm fixing the car. I get extra parts, but I fixed it. I'm faithful. I don't look at any other women. I do all in my power to be a really good husband. And then I come home one day, and she's sitting at the island or at the kitchen table, and she's crying. And I say, babe, what's the matter? And she says, nothing. <laughs> yeah, right. So I start guessing. Was it the power tool I bought you on Valentine's Day? I thought you'd want that. You got so many chores that that could have been used. I took the garbage out. What's the matter? You know, I'm up to date on the list. I've been faithful. Honey, what's the problem? What's the matter? And she says through her tears, when we got married, I looked in your eyes and there was fire. You wanted me. You pursued me. You desired me. And now, yes, you're a good husband, but it's not there anymore. There's no passion. That's the picture of Jesus in this text. That's staggering. And I think many of us, Unfortunately, even right now, are in that spot. 
In every other world religion, guys, you're required to do all this stuff, unimaginable things, just to possibly get their God to give you some kind of recognition, some kind of favor. And yet the picture of the Bible, this picture right here, is the Creator God longing to experience with us a passionate love affair. That's crazy. And yet so many of us, were too busy. We've got so many things going on. We're busy carrying out spiritual adultery, sometimes even in the name of Jesus. We've got no time for him. And he's coming to us like a lonely lover saying, where did you go? I don't see it. I don't think you love me anymore. There's so many things that contribute to that. And we've, we've talked about that at length. But one of the struggles that we consistently have is the struggle in our theology that somehow just boils down the message of salvation as a ticket to heaven. And because of that, we perform out of a sense of duty. We perform out of obligation. But it, 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 it just, you can see this. It's one of the ways that we even talk about it in our salvation. We seem to be stuck in this past tense terminology. We're consistently referring to our salvation in the past terms. The day we got saved. I've been saved for how long? It's like the day I got my marriage license. What's the deal? Who cares? And yet when you read the New Testament, there are three tenses. You see the past. You know, we, were, we, we came, we were born again, we were regenerated, regenerated, we've been saved. You see the present, I'm being saved. That's this love affair. And then the future, we will be saved. But out of the three tenses in the New Testament, that the one that is talked about the most is the one we talk about the least. We get stuck in the past. It would be like me again, me coming to you and saying, how's your marriage? How is everything going? Well, I've had my marriage license for 15 years. That's not what I asked. I didn't ask that. How is your relationship now? Are you growing? Are you thriving? Are you in love? I'm asking about the love affair today. Another way I think we can expose this theology is, is even just how we present the gospel. Some of you, hopefully many more than I even know, are actively sharing the gospel. And I commend you, I applaud you, I encourage you, keep doing it. But think about the presentations of the gospel that we've heard and we've shared. Maybe you've even memorized. How many of them focus on a place? If you died tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? You don't really want to go to hell, do you? You want to go to heaven, right? Wouldn't you rather go to the heaven? Go to heaven? I mean, we sound like real estate agents, not matchmakers. What's going to take for me to get you into this lovely condo in paradise? What's it going to take? What's the point of paradise if it's not the dwelling place of Jesus? Our love. See, we, again, we read the New Testament, the focus is not a place, it's a person. And Jesus even said, this is eternal life, that you know me. And him who sent me, then that word know is the same Greek word used to describe a love relationship between a husband and a wife. It's a very intimate term. The idea of the gospel is that, guys, we are playing matchmakers and we're explaining to people that there is something within their soul, deep within their soul, that longs for love, to be known by their creator, to know their creator, and only Jesus can fulfill that. That's the gospel. That's what we should be sharing as matchmakers. And Jesus, by his death on the cross, has made it possible for us not only to be forgiven, but to experience a, a relationship unlike anything we've ever had, but we've always desired. That's what your heart is longing for. And, and if you just acknowledge this, this true state, Call on his name and believe in your heart that he's God and that he's been raised from the dead. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. You can have this. It's, it's when you finally acknowledge the truth of your relationship with him, you can start moving forward in a relationship with him. He's Lord. He's the creator God who gave himself up to death 
And then after conquering death by his resurrection, he has made it a, a way possible for you to be rescued from death. But more than that, for you to be with him forever, dancing to the music of amazing grace. He has always been pursuing you. You guys hear that? God is pursuing you. He is chasing after you hard. Pepe Le Pew. He has no that one. He is after you. Committed to it. God, when, I, when I read through this letter of the church of Ephesus, it, it makes me go back to Genesis chapter 1 through 3. And I think you'll see why just in a couple of verses later. But you go back to Genesis chapter 1. God is this creator God. <laughs> this is like awe-inspiring. This guy, so powerful. He's doing all this wonderful stuff. And he just comes across a noble and powerful and, and scary possibly. I mean, but then you move to Genesis chapter 2 and suddenly the, the unimaginable happens. This uncomfortable intimacy appears. When the text moves from the creation uh, uh, into the creation of Adam, you start seeing this, this, this Hebrew kind of phrases and terminology that describe a, a potter with a piece of clay. God didn't need material to make Adam. He could have just spoke it, just like he did everything else. He could have just spoke it into existence, but when it comes to create Adam in his image, he rolls up his sleeves, he gets his hand in the clay, and then he makes this statement that is so different than anything else. So personal, so intimate. Guys, this is special. It says, After God formed Adam, it says that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He didn't just speak it from afar. He got in and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, we, post-COVID, we know personal space. <laughs> this is intimate. This is him coming close and breathing into his creation. God didn't need to do that. Again, he could have just said, Adam, breathe. He was making a point for us to know he wants intimacy with us. That's what he's after in your life. So many people come to church, they want to know, just, just tell me what to do. Tell me what you want from me. I'm telling you right now, God wants intimacy from you. He wants you to want him. Do you want to want? Sometimes that's all we can muster up. I want to want. I thirst to thirst, like Tozer said. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, they sin against God. You guys know how the story goes. But tucked away in this story, this is a, just overlooked for so long, this beautiful picture of what God has always wanted from us and wanted from you. We're told that God would come around in, in, in the specific time of day, the cool of the day, probably the nicest time, you know, for me that's like not dusk, but like right there when you start to have that change of color in the evening. I love it. I love to go for walks with Callie at that time, don't we? It's our favorite time of the day. But whatever it is, he comes at this wonderful time of the day so that he could have a love affair with them so that, could, so that they could go for walks. They did it every day. And so after, uh, after this in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve have sinned against God. God shows up for their date expecting to walk with them, but they're nowhere to be found. And they're hiding in the garden. And what does God cry? He, he yells out as it was, with the voice of a lover, where are you? This is not a question of location. You think he didn't know? He knows where they are. The, this is the heart of the letter of the church of Ephesus. It's a, a, an unveiling of the heart of Jesus. He comes and he says, where are you? I've looked into your eyes and I don't see it anymore. Something happened. Where did you go? What happened? You don't have your first love anymore. Something's changed and it breaks his heart. Verse 5. Therefore, so in light of that, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. We get some imperatives. These are commands. Verse five, again, the verb tenses are very important. The first command is to remember. It's, it's a continuing 
kind of a continuous presence. It, it basically means remember over and over. Remember and keep remembering. Remember and think about it often from where you have fallen. The verb tense of fallen is, is, is a perfect tense, which means this didn't happen over or just instantly. It, it happened over a, a period of time. It was a slow fade. It never happens over, just instantly, does it? It's always gradual. And then it creeps up on us. So this fire has slowly been going out over time. And he says, remember, he's saying, remember the days when we were in love. Remember it. Think about it. Remember when we just thought about each other every single day, all day. You couldn't, you couldn't help, couldn't wait to put up a picture of me in your, in your car, on your dash. You couldn't wait to put up a picture in your office. You, could, you couldn't wait to give me a call and spend time with me when you got out of bed. And we couldn't spend enough time together. We just danced and prayed together all day without effort. Remember when we were crazy in love. Remember that spot from which you've slowly drifted away. The second imperative is to repent. This verb tense repent is now. It's not a verb that that really just has the idea of maybe I should go back and think about it for a little while. Maybe we should have a little Bible study on this. What does it mean to repent? This is a lover standing on the back step, waiting for you to show up. And when you do, says, listen up. You've got to make a decision. It's either her or me. Calling you out. What's it going to be, bub? Is it her or is it me? Repent. Make your decision. Change your mind now. Very strong. And do the deeds that you did at first. Guys, love always has to have action. If Callie told me, you don't love me anymore, and just met me on the back step, something's got to change. I can't take this anymore. I'm not just going to walk past her, go sit in the chair and start thinking about, you know, like trying to muster up some feelings. I'm not going to go have, you know, a Bible study and get together. I'm like, what does this mean? What What is she asking of me? I'm going to pursue her. What, what is keeping me from pursuing her? What, what has taken my eye and my affection? I'm going to get these things out of my life. I'm going to pursue her like I once did. Better pursue me as one pursues a lover. I can't live this way anymore. Or what? He says, repent or what? Or else I am coming to you. This is verse 5. And will rem- remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. These are staggering words, and there's a lot in here. And I want God to speak to you in this moment and just make it as uncomfortable as it has to be. He's calling us to a decision. What's it going to be? This is a church that was busy. They're doing all sorts of stuff, all sorts of programs. They were doctrinally correct. This was a church that was dealing with the bad guys. They were, they were you know, dealing in church discipline. They were persevering. They were hanging in there. But then Jesus shows up and he says, listen up. If things don't change so that I see the fire of passion and love like it used to be, I'm shutting the doors. All these other things are good. Yeah, they're right on. But they're not an end in themselves. They're a means. They're a byproduct of our love relationship. They're good, but that's not what I've asked of you. I haven't asked you to do all these things. I've asked you to be in love with me and me alone. Some of you guys, that's God's word to you right now. I don't see the eye. I don't don't see the, the passion in your eyes anymore. Where, where did you go? And think about it. The, the purpose of a lampstand is to shed light into darkness. What Jesus is saying, where there is no love, there's no light. You can't shed light in a community without love. You can't love your neighbors. You can't love the people in the community without loving Jesus. First, Scripture tells us that. It goes on in verse 6, and he says, Yet this you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, 
which I also hate. It feels kind of out of place. You just kind of stuck it in there. It's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. It doesn't really go with the flow. We don't really even know accurately, definitively, I guess without debate, what the Nicolaitans believed. There's a lot of guesses and theories. And again, I don't think if, if we don't know for sure, let's just leave it at that. We don't know. But we do see this. They were doing things that were bad, that Jesus didn't like. He hated the deeds of this church, and they hated him too. Anytime you love, it comes with hate. Let me explain that. I love Callie. I'm going to hate anything that is bent on destroying her. Anything that is against her and opposed to her and out seeking to destroy her, I'm going to hate that thing because I love her. And so they had that right. It said that they hated their deeds. I think they didn't, they didn't hate the Nicolaitans, but they hated their deeds. I think Jesus is saying that there's still a flicker of hope. There's still a small fire burning in you. That's good. We're on the same page. We, we love the same things. We hate the same things. There's still hope. We can still fire this thing up, but we need to deal with it before it's too late. Verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Without question, guys, verse 7 is going all the way back to Genesis. That's why I went there earlier. And I said, in just a couple verses, you'll know why. He says, today you'll be, in me, be with me in paradise. Remember when he said that on the cross? That's what the story's always been about. Being with Jesus. Yeah, we're in paradise. We want to be in paradise. But it's being with Jesus. Without Jesus, it's not paradise. When he says those who overcome, he's not saying the super elite, the best of the best, you guys get in. That's contrary to everything the Bible teaches. What he's saying is those who truly believe will overcome. At the end of the day, you will experience the paradise you've always been promised. And that should produce within us a passionate love affair for the one who is there, who has created for that, that, us for that. That's what it's always been about. Jesus as our lover, crying out to us, saying, come, be with me. Be with me like you once were. I've been having a passionate love affair and an adventure with Callie for almost 16 years. I loved her. I can't get enough of you. Even when the others are <laughs> had enough, I can't get enough. And, and I hope, I'd say I guarantee, but that's her to say, when she looks in my eyes, she still sees fire, a passion for her. Do you? Please, please, because Ellie, I just said, <laughs> please say yes. <laughs> I can't imagine what it would be like, though, to look into her eyes where I once saw a fire to not see it anymore. I just can't imagine what that would be like, to look into my lovers, my wives, my, my, my spouse, my partner, and not see a reciprocated passion, uh, the fire back. I can't, some of you guys have experienced that. I, can't, I just can't imagine how hard and difficult that is. It's got to be horrible. And yet this is the picture of Jesus in this letter towards us. Jesus is standing there as a lover, looking into the eyes of his bride, and he's saying, I just don't see it anymore. I don't, I don't see it. You, you, you run lots of programs. You study well. You're doctrinally sound. You chase away the bad guys. I mean, you show up early to church. You do all these things. You're hanging in there. You're not, you're not going with the culture. But to be honest, though, I just don't see it. You're doing all these things, but there's no fire for me. There's no zeal for me. Just, we'll get back to it. Let's just think for a minute the steps. The steps that we would take to come back. To come back to this relationship. Uh, you've got to rekindle this love. What would you do? 
If that, if that were you, if you were in that relationship and someone has said that to you, what would you do? We're going to bring our musicians up here actually right now. But would you go when you find someone that you trust and ask for help? Yeah, you would. Would you, would you pursue this person and, and set everything aside and say, look, I'm not going until we, until we fix this, until we resolve this? Yeah, you probably would. Guys, we, we as a church want to help you rekindle this love with Jesus. That's what we're for. That's why we're doing Experiencing God. That's why, that's why we gather. That's why we pray. That's why we have time after this. So that as, as God is leading you to say something or leading, just putting something on your mind, you have opportunity to share and to encourage one another. We are in this together and we need to rekindle it. Which church has it right? The ideal church does what well? What I'm presenting to you guys right now is that the church, the church that has it right is the church that cultivates a passionate love affair with Jesus. And we're going to do that right now by singing some more songs. You guys notice we kind of cut it short earlier, but that's so that we can do it right now. If God is telling you he doesn't see it in your eyes anymore, I want you to meditate on these songs. I want you to think about these words, and I want you to cry them out to him. I want you to pray them to him. With all that you have, return to your first love. That's what he wants from you. Let's sing.
As I was reading about that, that bridge, the day and night, night and day, let incense arise, I, was, I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so I started looking up scriptures about incense in scripture and mm. how it, it, it was one thing in the Old Testament, but then in the New Testament, it was, it was, it's referring to prayer. And when I read the scriptures that talk about how God responds to the incense, our prayers coming up to him. Man, I was convicted. My prayers are important to him. They're sweet to him. It's like maybe writing a love letter to him. I don't think I take that seriously enough. So anyway, I started singing that bridge, and I, I just had a whole new revelation with it. That's my desire day and night, in and out, up and down, all of it. I want my prayer to rise to the Lord and have it be a blessing to him. That's, that's my heart. Maybe that's so simple, I don't know. But it was a whole new revelation for me, and I was... I was convicted by it. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and
love you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts this morning. Pray that we would take it out into our community, into our town, into our county and state and country and world. That we would bless you. Rekindle that fire, Lord. We do want it. I want it. I thank you for that. I love you. Thank you for going before us. In your name I pray. Amen.